Hey everyone, I'm Richard. This is Grey Wizard Gaming, and today I'm talking about how to win with the Ancients. So hopefully you've watched the other videos so you know who the Ancients are and what their abilities are. And in this video, I'm just gonna be talking about strategies of how to win and kind of the timing, right? Like, so assuming you know all the powers, what are the what is the timing and, and how do you respond to certain scenarios? So first of all, you have to choose where do you start? I have this game set up for a four, four person game, pretty traditional kind of setup, Great Cthulhu, Black Goat, and Crawling Chaos. I have the left side set up for three players, the right side set up for five players. And where do you start? Well, for me, the Ancients almost always start in North Atlantic. And the primary reason for that is because it puts you squarely in the middle so that you can get a lot of different cathedrals for the one cost. Remember, cathedrals cost one when they are not adjacent to any other cathedrals. So I always choose to start in North Atlantic. Now, you can't be too predictable, so if people start responding to you and shutting you down because you start there, of course you should respond. Uh, if, if too many factions started on the left side, maybe opener the way and sleeper I might at that point just choose to take advantage of the right side being open and then I might choose Arabia I think Arabia is a pretty good starting location you're adjacent to a lot of things uh, it's not as ideal because you are not adjacent to the chevrons at that point but there you go this is where I'd start and so you want to negotiate with other people. If you're the kind of person who makes deals and backstabs them, you may not want to play the Ancients, period. You just may not want to play them because the Ancients are about manipulating people into doing what you want. And so, for example, one of the first things I might do is I might move a cultist into the Black Goat area because they have a chevron symbol. And so I move there and I say, hey, please do not capture my cultist. I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna build a nice cathedral, make everything pretty around here, and then you're gonna get one more power every single turn. This is something I'm giving you. I could give it to anybody. I'm giving it to you. My request is to leave me there for a little bit I'll get back out. Don't worry, I'm not gonna steal your gate, I'm gonna get back out. So then of course you summon the cathedral. At that point, you get your first spell book. I would not, <laughs> I would not choose worship services yet. Worship services is what gives them the one power for having a cathedral there. You get one power too, by the way. I wouldn't choose it yet. I'd say, hey, I'm going to have worship services by the end of the round, but I have other stuff that I need to do right now. And personally, if this scenario went well and you're looking at him in the eyes and you're like, I can trust, I can see you're an honorable person. I can see it. Then I would move on and I would get festival. Festival lets you summon unmen for zero power. So the thing about unmen is that you're giving enemies power and you might think okay well great i've got a partnership with black goat no you have partnerships with nobody everybody's your enemy you're trying to win here so first turn there is no leader i mean you may know and i may know that a certain person is likely to win because they usually win right they're a good player that person is basically, in my, in my opinion, the leader, even first turn, but there is no real first like leader, right? You're all pretty much equal at this point. They're all doing stuff. They're, they're getting gates and, and so on. So at this point, getting festival, I would summon a unmen to protect my home base. It costs zero power. So it's churning up a turn and it makes everybody else take another action right? So the more actions you can churn, the more you can kind of see what they're doing. And I would give the one power 
to somebody else that you kind of want to fight Black Goat. In this scenario, if it was Black Goat, whoever your first ally is, you want to keep everybody evil while you step on their corpses to get higher towards that 30 doom point goal. So you have an unmen, you might summon another unmen. It's up to you. It just turns through another turn, but you're also giving out another power. You can give it all to Crawling Chaos. You can dis, you know, distribute it out to, to Cthulhu. You really want everybody to think, hey, you're on the same board as them, but at least at this point, you're more here to help everybody. You really don't want to be the minions of Black Goat because they will not protect you. In the end, they're trying to kill you too. They're trying to crush you too. So I don't like to have a tight partnership with one person because in the end, and that means it's almost like I have to backstab them here. I'm like, hey, I'm doing my thing. I'm giving power out equally. What you guys do is on your own. And when you do that, they subconsciously want to step out and fight each other the way they should if you were not playing. But now they're more powerful. And, and in this scenario, Black Goat and Crawling Chaos are both more powerful. I'm sorry, Great Cthulhu and Crawling Chaos got their power first, right? They got their power now. Black Goat has to wait. They have to be nice to you because at the end of the turn, the cathedral, cathedral is going to give them their extra power and every turn after that. Everybody wants a cathedral in their lands. But they didn't get the power yet. And that's important. So around this scenario, you could summon another Unmen, but you'd have to give out more power. And personally, I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. So at this point, I'm going to take a, um, a cultist. I'm going to move my cultist into probably somewhere along the lines of Scandinavia. I'm going to summon a gate. So one power, two power, five power, right? So I spent five power at this point, six power for the cathedral. I'm going to summon another cathedral, seven power. I have one power left. And at that point, this is where I live up to my... Um, my promise and I give them worship services. So worship services. Now we gain one power and they gain one power for every cathedral that is in another person's territory. And now I still have one power so I can still take actions. At this point, I'm going to give every enemy their lowest cost monster at their controlled gate for free. Now, if you get lucky, if you get lucky, this would be a little bit different because when I say lucky, there would be another gate in a symbol from an enemy that you could build and make another partnership deal with. I just, I just think in most scenarios, it's not really going to happen. So, it could. Arabia is, is, is Arabia is probably going to have a, col, uh, a gate. If Crawling Chaos is there, do it there. Again, try not to form tight partnerships. So this, this could just be as, just as easily, um, you know, that. But in this scenario, they're far away, not close enough for you to get into their space. You've built a cathedral. You're probably going to lose this gate. That's fine. You're going to have one last round of stuff to do. You spend your action, you give each enemy their lowest cost monster at their controlled gate for free, and this is going to start triggering wars. So everybody's going to start having cheap monsters out, and at that point, you're going to get another power, and I personally would recommend Extinction. Because... Because you want your Yothans out. Ideally, two, because Yothans are beasts. Uh, technically, they're terrors, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So with your last power, I would move your cultist back out. That's me. It's going to set you up for dematerialization. And in general, 
I do not like to leave my, my cultists in other people's spaces. It can trigger them. They don't like it. It always antagonizes people. I just don't do it. I always move out, even if it's not that advantageous to move my cultist out because I don't want them targeting me. Okay, so next round, you've got six cultists, you've got two gates, you've got one shared cathedral. So my math says that's 11 power. And you have the ability to summon your terrors, your Yothans, for three power each. Now, in your, in your second turn, your goal is to keep up with the combat dice and potential of your enemy. Now, looking at your spell books, you have two easy spell books. And I'm not talking about the, as an action, let people summon their most powerful monster. Because ideally, you would do that when it's too late for anything to stop you. So, your next two spell books, you need to have a cathedral somewhere that does not have a symbol. And you need to get a cathedral in somewhere that has the, I don't know, it's the swirly circle symbol. So, uh, for some reason, I always think it's like the Aurora Boros symbol. I don't know why. That's what I call it. Okay. So, in general, I would try to get Unholy Ground and I would try to get Consecration out. That leaves Brainless. I know. I know. Um, it's hard, guys. It's really hard. You have to make that decision if... Um, I mean, no matter what, you're going to need Unholy Ground to defeat the Great Old Ones. And you need consecration so that you can start gaining those elder signs when you're doing the doom ritual, which you want to do every turn as fast as possible. So I, that's my order, guys. Unholy ground, consecration. You know, you, you got some stuff out. You're, you're doing things. And brainless, you're not going to do until you... Well, until the game's over, effectively, really. I mean, if the game is dragging out, right? There's too much combat going on. Everybody is, their gates are being kept low because they're, instead of building new gates, everybody's taking them from each other. There's a lot of different scenarios in your game that might make things drag out. In that scenario, if they're all at war, you might as well give them their highest power monster. Also... If the leader, if the leader has their most powerful monsters out, say, I don't know, I mean, maybe Black Goat has all of their Dark Young out. If that's the scenario and the other people are struggling to keep up, that's where you can give everybody their highest cost monster and they... The, the leader will not benefit. So that's what I look for, right? I want to give everybody their lowest cost monster when they don't need it. And I want to give everybody their highest cost monster when they've already spent the power purchasing their highest cost monsters. So that's what you need to look for. And when you see it, you say like, oh, Black Goat summoned all their dark young? Or, um, you know, maybe... Crawling Chaos summoned all of their, their hunting whores. Give them a flying polyp. Yay! You got a flying polyp. I love flying polyps. However, just from a power perspective, right? From a just from an efficiency perspective, giving everybody else who's probably not liking Crawling Chaos right now because they have so many monsters out, giving everybody else a boost and saying, hey guys, go at it. Now you have your last spell book. However, um, I don't, I, I mean, I, so far I haven't relied too much on the reanimated. I really prefer the Yothans. And that's probably because I'm a very social player and I really do like to make deals and negotiate. And, and the scenario I'm trying to set up is let's just enjoy the engine, right? Let's just enjoy building up our things and whoever can build our things up faster, we deserve to win. 
that's what I kind of like try to like plant in people's heads. And so that's advantageous to me. So that's how that's why I probably play that way. However, um, you have to keep in mind some some certain things that are subtle. They're subtle, right? Okay, one, I'll just put these out. One, Yothans are terrors. So a terror is not a monster. A Yothan is equal to a terror for most intents and purposes, right? A, a, a monster can eat a cultist, but a monster cannot eat a cultist if another monster is there to protect the cultist. However, a great old one can eat a cultist or capture a cultist even if there's a monster there to protect the cultist. Right? Easy enough. Okay. So a another great old one can block that cultist from being eaten, right? So this is the order of things. A terror and a monster are equal in terms of their ability to block or capture. However, Great Cthulhu has the ability devour, pre-battle. The enemy player eliminates one of his monsters or cultists in the battle his choice. So in that scenario, you want to, I mean, they're immune to it. Right? Yothans are immune to devour. Yothans are immune to being captured by a sleeper. Yothans are terrors, and they're just immune to anything that says monster. Now, cosmic terrors are one step up. You know, so they they are more powerful than terrors, but this is just a terror. So, okay, great. The is exactly what you want, by the way. You want all these uh, all these things all in one place. It's not yours. All right. So what else is going on? Well, you have these unmen who cost zero. So in general, when you're inflicting pains or kills, you know, you want them to affect your zero cost things because then you're going to just summon them back for free as the next action, as long as you still have actions left. However, once you activate Brainless, Brainless makes it so these things do not have the ability to do anything without another of your units in that space. So that, that's not a Brainless, not a uh, reanimated. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit. So Ancients are a combat-heavy faction. I know it might not immediately seem like it, but it should because Yothans have seven combat dice and you have three of them, possibly three of them. So in, in a combat, the Ancients, how you, how you deal with the post-battle is vitally important. So I'm going to go through a pretty reasonable advantage. So first of all, the Ancients don't have to choreograph what they're necessarily doing, right? So, you know, in the Doom phase, you just say, hey, um, I'm going to dematerialize this many units. I'm going to appear here. So, boom. Black Goat thought they're your buddy. They wondered because you're the, you never put the cathedral back, but they understood. But now you've decided two things. One, they're going to lose Shabnigarath. Two, or at least you want to try to get rid of... No, you're, they're going to lose Shabnigarath. They don't have a choice. Two, you're going to take this gate. That's what you've decided. You're going to start the, the steamroll, which is what you do when you start doing Rituals of Annihilation with Ancients. So in this scenario, I've got two reanimated, I've got a cultist, and I've got an undying, and I've got a Yothan. So seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven combat dice... And for Shabnigarath, I've got, she's equal to the number of cultists plus number of controlled gates plus dark young. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten combat dice. Okay. Wait. 
One of these is not right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's fine. Uh, six will be kill, four and five will be pains. So I got three kills. I've got all the pains in the world. So I will not be taking this gate this turn. And I've got one kill and two pains. Didn't matter I, I had more combat dice, but things are not over, right? First of all, I'm going to sacrifice a citadel, cathedral. <laughs> I don't know what guys. I'm gonna sacrifice a cathedral and that means that the great old one must be eliminated. All right, so no more great old one. That's the brutal thing about ancients, guys. That's it. So, okay, then she's gonna activate Necrophagy. So, boom, now there's another pain. I like to personally, I just like to track them, so I just go ahead and move another die to a pain. Doesn't matter. Um, no, it literally doesn't matter at this point because they had so many pains. Actually, she's just going to leave it there. Don't do unnecessary pains. It's just kind of worthless. All right. So now at this point, you have to worry. Okay. So the unmen are zero power to summon back. So normally you want to assign pains there. That's that's easy enough. Uh, I mean, not pains, kills. So you sign a kill, so killed, and then you've got four more units. Obviously, you're not going to want to kill your Yothan, but you, um, you're gonna have to kill two more units. You probably want to, uh, you probably wanna kill the, well, let's just say that you wanna kill the, the animated and the cultist. I think it's pretty easy to get those back. And now you have a reanimated. This is um, this is what you have to worry about. Crawling Chaos controls pains. At this point, they'll have that spell book out. So what they'll do to you is they will try to put your units in separate spaces. And so they say, well, that's fine. The Yothan can go over here. And the Reanimated will go over to Arabia. Reanimated are brainless. They can take no actions once you have the spell book, except if there's another non reanimated nearby. And that's, and this is why often it is better to assign the kills to the reanimated over assigning them to say something cheaper or even free. Because the last thing you want is. These units, you can't move them. You can't do anything. You have to literally move somebody in or you have to waste your dematerialization to dematerialize them back. So they're not totally helpless, but you don't wanna do that. So if it's gonna cost you an opportunity, if it's gonna cost you power, kill your cultist first. Do not kill you're reanimated. Obviously, you want to kill your, um, in this scenario, I might consider, well, I don't know. I mean, I personally would always kill the zero power unmen and then a reanimated. Then, when Crawling Chaos screws me, I mean, hopefully I just get him back. I don't know. He is, it's just gonna cost me something no matter what, right? So if it's gonna cost me something, I, maybe it's, maybe it's better. Maybe it's better to keep your unmen and kill your, your reanimated. Honestly, you, like you can't do anything with them. Whereas in this scenario, at least I can resummon my, my reanimated for one power. And summoning unmen give my enemies zero, uh, give me, give them one power and cost me zero power. So yeah, that's what I really wanted to emphasize is it is often 
more advantageous to you in a battle scenario to kill your reanimated over really over anything else. Now, if there's no Crawling Chaos player, things start changing. Obviously, in that scenario, you would move your reanimated in with everybody else, and you would just, you know, resummon your unmin. Even in that scenario, you have to worry, are you giving too much power to your enemies? Are they too close to you? Is there somebody really at the bottom that you can give power and help them, you know, pad them up? There's, you know, there's all those scenarios. Um, that you have to you have to kind of consider as ancients. Ancients, you have to be very very aware of where everybody else is and make sure that you are giving the lowest person stuff to help them catch up. And that's why ultimately I think the ancients are some of the best factions to to add to your group because they inherently help the weakest player. Not you being the weakest player as the Ancients. I mean, they are helping, if you have a five-person game, a six-person game, seven-person game, whoever the weakest person is, suddenly they're getting a helping hand without any additional crazy rules, without handicap rules, without nothing. It's just you have these gifts to bestow and you should be giving them out. Now, like I said, towards the end of the game, you're going to be using your combat dice to try to get four to five gates and trying to do your ritual track to try to get your doom points right and if possible if possible you want to try to trigger instant death if not out you know obviously flat out 30 point plus doom points sure that's great but you want to trigger instant death if it looks like the other players are struggling to get their six spell books because you can get your six spell books anytime I mean, you just get them. So with that, you really need to look at the ritual track. You need to see how much you can do it. If you can keep four cathedrals in four enemy gate areas, that's amazing because you will be plus four power above and beyond whatever else you have. Plus they'll all only, if, if it's in a five person game, they'll each only be one more power. And oddly enough, that actually means that you're creating targets because you put a cathedral in a gate and now people, if they steal that gate from that player, they're going to get two power per turn from that gate because it has a cathedral there. But if they steal one of your gates, they're only going to get one power. Because presumably you're not very often going to have a cathedral in your area. If you do, like in this scenario, I, I put a just to get the spell book, I put a cathedral where a spell uh, where a gate was. That's a mistake in the middle of the game. In the beginning of the game, it's kind of fine. You put it there and you're like, somebody's gonna steal a gate anyways. Again, it's a target because if people want a gate, they can take your normal gate that gives them one power per or two power per turn. Or they can, sorry guys, um, or they can take a gate with a cathedral, which gives them three power per turn. Obviously, they want those gates. It it can start wars. If they start realizing that, and if you happen to kind of seed those, those ideas, they're going to, even if they know you're seeding the ideas, even if they know that they're, that you're, they're playing into your hands, there's no way they can change the scenario that a gate plus a cathedral gives them three power per turn. That's a true statement. It's not a manipulation. You manipulated it by putting a cathedral in a powerful person's area that you're like, well, hey guys, if you do what I want, if you attack the target I want, here you go. You're going to get more power. And the other and the first guy was like, wait a minute, I thought you were helping me out. Well, I was, if you could hold on to it. Um, this this is it. This is my how to win with ancients. It's a lot of manipulation, it's a lot of being very careful in your strategies in battle, and it's really, really trying to balance out the whole table hopefully leaving you 
the most ahead. So with that, I'd love to get your comments down below and see what, um, what strategies you've come up with. I think there's definitely some strategies involving the terrors, being the fact that Yothans are not monsters. Uh, I'd love to, for you guys to point those out. And with that, bye guys.